this, but the government, the United States government has had its hand on these alien aircraft, and we've captured them, and not only that, we've captured some which have pilots on board. Some are alive and some dead. Not only that, this guy turns around and says, and he's a, up to now, usually people with, you know, tinfoil hats have been saying this. This guy is a recognized military who had certain clearances which your average American, for sure, and even in the military, do not have. You can watch this interview. It's a three, four-minute interview, and then they publish the half-hour interview with him, and he's really, really convincing. I mean, he even goes as far as to say that we don't have one or two. We have a whole bunch of them, and we are reverse engineering them here in the United States to find out how they work. It's something called reverse engineering. That means you get a product, which is a finished product, and you work away backwards to figure out exactly how it works. We reverse engineering these alien aircraft. And when he was asked whether there be people in the military who have been hurt or injured by any of these aircraft, he's like, yes, I cannot give you details, he said, but there are people who have been hurt by these aliens and maybe the aircraft themselves. So let's just summarize what this dude is saying. He's a high-level dude. He, you can look him up. The video's online. Mainstream media kind of pushed it aside. Government denies it, but that's the entire point. He's like, we have the alien aircraft. We've got a whole bunch of them. We even have some of the people on board. This has been going on for decades in the United States, and they spend more money covering it up, is what he says, than actually we do researching it, because it has to be kept a big secret. This is pretty much, Bekitsur, what this guy has been saying. Up to now, I've always been interested in extraterrestrial life, but when this guy said it, for the first time, I was like, something's going on. People are interviewed, have interviewed him. People who know him say, the guy is the real deal. He's not a liar. But the information he's been receiving may not be what he thinks it is. And he couldn't, and he didn't produce any documents, because he's like, if I do, I'm in big trouble, but I'm allowed to reveal this information to you. Some people say it's complete nonsense. Some people say that it's absolutely true, and this is a soft landing, which means that they're gonna reveal a lot more to us, but they don't wanna shock us. I mean, let's just say, for instance, let's say it's true for just a second. I'm not saying it is. I'm not saying I believe it is true, but let's just say it's completely true, and they have alien aircraft, and the extraterrestrials, and what they're doing over here, and how they got, we'll leave that aside because it's going to take a big deal for them to get over where they are. But let's just say it came out right now. The news is tonight. They're extraterrestrials. What's going to happen in America straight away? Panic. Panic. What happens when people panic? They shop. They shop. <laughs> for what? Toilet paper. Toilet paper. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and they get ang anxious. They go and they go for food and water and they buy guns. 100%. It's called modem mixat. Modem mixat. Once they, once they admit a little bit, it's a Jewish concept, you're like, well, what else are they lying to us about? You lose all your trust in the government itself. People are going to freak out. They're going to buy stuff. They're going to get guns. Stock market crashes, right? No one's going on vacation. Who wants to fly when they know that all these orbs, and by that, that, there is footage and a lot of interviews by pilots. Pilots, because they're up in the sky, who say and have videoed various objects for many, many years. So that's out there, that's for sure. Could these objects be other items from other nations? It could be. However, the problem is they defy physics. That's what these pilots say, they defy physics, and it's way beyond any technology that is known here in the United States. I used to think it was Russia, but I've seen Russia's performance in Ukraine. I don't think they have such advanced technology. They may have nuclear capability, but this is not nuclear capability. This is something that absolutely defies physics. Are we together so far? Okay. So that is the claim of this guy. And now the interest in this has gone very, very high. And there was a case in Vegas, which, I don't know, some family, how come I'm the only one who sees this stuff? See what happened in Vegas? Is this family were out middle of the night, like fixing their car. And they said that they saw these aliens arrive in their backyard. <laughs> And they called the cops, and the cops came and interviewed them, and it really was, God bless you, and it really seemed to be like, but there have been these kind of sightings all the time, and we have no idea, and 
This kind of stuff I kind of like. I laugh at it and I push it aside. And maybe it's true, maybe it's not, but who cares? But this one guy was very, very convincing. Okay. What's the Jewish view? So it happens to be that there are a number of sources that I found because I'm collecting this stuff. Many, many sources that discuss whether extraterrestrial life exists. I'll start actually in the most present, and that is the Lubavitch Rebbe was approached by a guy who said he works for NASA, and he says they're putting him on a mission to see if there is extraterrestrial life out there. Okay? We're going to go back, by the way, to the prophets in a second, but let's just start modern day. And he said, is it worth my time to be working on this secret project to search for, it's called SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, to be part of this whole thing as a religious Jew, should I be on this thing to be looking for extraterrestrial life? What do you think the Lubavitch Rebbe said when he was asked whether he should, this guy should waste his time, supposedly, looking for extraterrestrial life? Yes. Yes what? He said yes, we should go. Why? By the way, I'm going to, there's other post came today of Hans who just died who said absolutely not. He did say yes, which is why I mentioned him. But what was his rationale? And his rationale is actually based upon, I've since found out, upon the writings of the Rishonim and Acharonim, the early and later commentators. No, not safety. Not safety. He said you should because if you do find aliens on other planets, if you do find them, or even searching for them is a good thing because you're saying that God's power is not limited to this world only. You're saying that HaKadosh Baruch Hu isn't limited as that way, but you saying there's no extraterrestrial life, even the possibility of it, you're saying that God doesn't have the possibility to create other life. And therefore, it's okay to say there possibly is, and it's okay, okay to go look at, is there or is there not? We don't know. But if you say that there isn't, you're limiting God's power, and that's not a good thing. And that's based upon, we'll see some of the later sources. You have a question? Yeah. We're not even, we haven't even started yet. Not much to wrap your head around. Okay, so it's a question. It's a question. Yeah. Are you what he's saying? By us looking us, into alien us, life, us, us, is it bad for who? Is it a good thing or a bad thing? Should we do it? Ah, okay, fine. That's a good question. Okay, fine. There are people who say we should not get involved in this or shouldn't send messages to spaces they do because you're going to hear back from these people and maybe these people are not so good. Right? Maybe they're malevolent. And by the way, this guy happens to say, this David Grush says, the ones that we've been, we can't understand what they're thinking at this point. That he says for sure. But he said that the interaction we have had with them doesn't mean they're good people. We like to think of them as friendly, you know, E.T. with a long finger, healing us from our diseases, you know? He says, not necessarily. Actually, there's more chance that they're actually not good people at all and maybe want to hurt us. So maybe you're right. Maybe we don't really want to be dealing with that at all. There is a prophetess by the name of Devorah. Devorah. And Devorah was a prophetess in the time, she was a judge of Israel. She was a very holy and great woman. And in the book of Shoftim Judges, chapter 5, 23, she makes a statement. And the statement is, Aror Maroz, cursed be Meroz, this star of Meroz, which some people translate as Mars, Meroz is Mars, cursed be them, Amalach Hashem, Aru Aru Yoshvea, and not only is Maz, or Meroz, cursed, so too are Yoshvea. What does Yoshvea mean? The people who live there. So the planet's cursed, and the Yoshvea means the people who reside in it. That is a statement from the prophets, okay? From the writings. 
Yoshve Kilo Bo Lezrat Hashem. They didn't come to help God, whatever means, Lezrat Hashem Begvoratam, with their strength. Okay. So Mero says the Gemara, because the Gemara looks into this and says, is the name of a star. And whenever you use the explanation of a inhabitant, we automatically think, well, they look like us. But that doesn't necessarily mean so. It could just mean they are various beings or various creatures that live over there. Those who do not believe in extraterrestrial life, for which there are some as well, obviously, they basically say that the inhabitants are spiritual in nature. Right? It's not actually anyone living there. But that's hard to say. Because you would describe them as malachim. You wouldn't describe them, right, as Yoshve, as people who live on that star on that planet. Okay. The Zohar, who does talk about this, brings down that actually there are, he says, inhabitants on other planets. Okay. Not too surprising because that's Kabbalah. And they are not, they do not look like us in any way, shape, or form, he says. Okay? And they may even be endowed with intelligence and knowledge. They have that. They have a certain amount of chokhmah and dat that they have wherever they are. Why God created them? We're not too sure. We'll see a few opinions in a few minutes why that is. However, and this seems to be a running thread through most of the commentators, although there could be, as we're going to see, inhabitants on those other planets, they do not have bechira, free will. Free will is uniquely on planet Earth. Just like an animal does not have free will. They don't have free will. They have intuition. So there could be creatures on those planets. They have maybe tremendous intelligence, but they don't have Bechira free will. They act out like, like robots or AI maybe or something like that. That's how most of the people, uh, commentators, seem to understand that. Okay. So, in other words, they could be smarter than us, and they could have knowledge greater than us. Let me ask you this. Is your computer smarter than you? Is your computer smarter than you? Yeah, it is smarter than you. It can do calculations better than you, play chess better than you, right? Does it have a personality? Does it make free will decisions? Does it make ethical decisions? No, it does not. So, how do we define... Right? Is your dog smarter than you? Well, it can do certain things better than us. It can run farther than us. Maybe it can smell things better than us. Right? It doesn't have free will. It works on instinct. And that seems to be how it's understood. Yeah? So, how do they come up with this stuff? Is it like prophecy or is it like... So this was... Well, well, she was a, a shofet. She was aware of this. She was in a VS. She had this information. According to this, according to this, yeah. This, this is the one source. I mean, explicit source. Oh, oh, we're going to come to that. We're going to come to We're going to come to them. So they're going to have to get it from somewhere else. But there's going to be a Gemara. We're not to the Gemara. We're going back. We're going, we started now. We're going to go right back. This is the furthest back we can go with any reference, explicit reference to life on other planets. Yeah. Yeah. That was, yeah, that was in Shoftim, the book of Judges, the book of Shoftim. She's actually, it's part of a song. She sings a song, so it's poetic in nature. But, yeah, she's kind of like uh, giving praise to God. And while she's doing that, she knocks these people who live on Mars. And then my second question is, so you're saying these other entities could have intelligence, they could be more intelligent Okay, so far we looked at one, so we have like 15 sources to get through. I don't think I get a chance tonight because Robert Rubin is going to speak in about 10 minutes. So we have to carry on next week. But uh, yeah, according to what we looked at so far, Zohar says they're intelligent, they're smart. That doesn't mean they have free will. So if they don't have free will, what direction? That's a good question. Well, what directs a dog? Do they have a what directs it? No, good question. What directs a creature that has no free will? That's, that's animal yeah, it's instinct. God may have created creatures like animals on other planets that have instinct, which are a lot more intelligent than the creatures are on this planet. Although, 
you could argue that creatures on this planet are also pretty intelligent. But what's the but not as intelligent as humans. Well, what? No. But the creatures on this planet are not as intelligent. That is true. But, but we gave the example, well, they are intelligence. They have certain abilities that we don't have, which exceed us. Yeah. They see things. They move faster than us. Understand things maybe more than, faster than we do. We have free will. But even a computer is extremely intelligent and has no free will. I mean, well, until we get to AI and then we could be in big trouble. Uh, okay. Is it possible to have a computer that creates its own decision making? We're seeing that right now. It's AI. We're seeing it right now. Maybe these life forms have that instilled in them. No reason why not. Yeah? Don't we program these computers? That's okay. Our computers we do. Our computers we do, but this is not what's happening over here. We, God, God has, I gave, there was a mashal analogy, right? God was the one who gives animals instinct and maybe gives these other creatures instinct as well. Yeah. Yeah, sure. What is the basis for saying that they don't have free will? Where, where is any... Ah, very, very good. As in to say that they don't have free... Oh, because... Free will is a, okay, this is discussed. Free will is a uniquely human characteristic, meaning only creatures who are created on this earth and this world, right? Shemaim va'aretz, created in this world, were given the Torah and have the ability to make free will decisions. That, that, okay, according to the, we know nothing for fact, but that is what all the commentators seem to say. They seem to be, there seems to be a consensus among the vast majority of them that if they do exist, they're not like us and they don't have free will as we understand it. They maybe have something very similar or something even completely different to it, yeah? But it's not free will per se, that it's purely given to creatures in this earth, people are from Olam Azeh and Olam Haba. That's what it's based upon. It's exactly that. But I think there are other says that say they could have free will as well. There are other commentators that say that. We're going to see there's a whole plethora. Okay, so let's go back. Let's go back. There's a lot to discuss here, and we're just getting going over here. There was a Gemara. There is a Gemara in Avodah Zarah, which I learned many years ago, and then I picked up again this morning just to double-check it. And the Gemara says the following. The Gemara says, well, it's a question in the Gemara. What does God do by day and by night? Interesting question. Actually, there's a number of Gemarot that try to figure out what God is doing with this time. And what does it even mean, what does God do with this time? What's he interested in? Okay, so that's a very... Why that question even comes up is a question of itself, but we'll leave that aside. So the Gemara says over there the following. It says, Amar Rav Yehuda, Amar Rav, Shtayim there are 12 hours that exist in the day, and there's 12 hours that exist at night. And God sits and learns Torah during the daytime 12 hours, okay? Vedan et kol om kolo, and judges the world. So we don't know what that even means, but I'm just telling you at face value, God is involved in Torah, and he's judging this world. Over Laila Mayavitz, what's he doing at nighttime? We got another 12 hours to go. So what does he do? Anybody know the answer to this question? He what? Ah, that's very, very good. So okay. that's a very famous... <laughs> right, right, so, yeah, yeah, very, very good. He's doing that as well. He's making Zibugim. That's right, that's right. He does say that. Yeah, yeah. What does God do with this time? That's the Gemara as well. I can't take it about. Yeah, that's true. Um, over here, however, this Gemara says no. At nighttime, Rochev al Kruv Kal, he travels on a, a cherub of some sort. He's got some kind of Kruv Kal Shalot. The Shat... And he is floating around in 18,000 worlds. There are 18,000 worlds that God travels through. That's what he does at night time. And he brings down a verse from Tehillim to prove that that's what he's doing at this time. So the Gemara gets it from Tehillim. What are these worlds? And what are the 18,000 number? By the way, interestingly, Tehillim says there's 20,000. 
And the Gemara says, yeah, but the last 2,000 don't really count. It chops off 2,000, 18,000. This piece of Gemara, my friends, is going to be the source for all of the alien extraterrestrial, I don't use the word aliens, but extraterrestrial that things are not from this planet elsewhere based on this Gemara. And the thing from Devorah a little bit as well. But that's only one planet. This is, what are these 18,000 worlds the Gemara is speaking about that King David included inside Sefer Tehillim? What is that exactly? What's going on with that? So the first time we see anyone talk about actual, explicit extraterrestrial life is actually from um, the Bala Itim, who lived in Spain in the 11th century. That means the Rishon. Now, the Rishonim are from the, what, the late 1000s to the, like, 1400s, like Rashi, right, included, and Rambam, and Ramban. These are big, when they speak, we listen, right? And there's a lot of them. We know a few of them, but there were many, many, many of them who are out there. So he, the Bale Itim, also known as the Rimi Barcelona, because he came from Barcelona, he turns around and says, yeah, these 18,000 worlds are actually or could actually be inhabited planets. Inhabited planets with some form of creatures. That's what he says. How do you get that? Because it can't just be spiritual beings and creatures, because there's a massive universe with billions of planets. And you can't see these are just spiritual worlds, because the amount of spiritual worlds are infinite. The fact the Gemara, based on Tehillim, King David's words, who's a prophet, limits us up to 18,000 and says that God is traveling and dealing with the inhabitants of those 18,000 already is suspicious. And he says, that's what I believe. And that's possible. He says, it's also possible that they are not inhabited with life as we know it, but certain angels and spirits. But then he seems to push that away and says, that doesn't make sense either because no time do you ever see inhabited without having some kind of intelligent being located at that place. That's what he says. That's the first time we see it. So he kind of goes backwards and forwards and forwards and backwards, and he's not very happy with it, but he goes with it. Okay? Then we go a little bit further to the 1300s, and there was a rabbi called Rab Chazde Kreskas, who's always quoted when it comes to this, and he wrote a book called Or Hashem, The Light of God, and he has a whole discussion and he says, based upon this Gemara of 18,000 planets that God visits at night time, he is involved, with, during the day he's involved with us, and night time he's involved with them. He's like, it's okay to believe we're on life on other planets. Not a problem. Doesn't take away from the Torah. Doesn't take away from Olam Azeh, anybody else at all. It's a possibility. It's a possibility. And... It would just mean, and he likes it as well, that God is in control of this world and is in control of the entire universe. Because a person could be like, well, Hashem created this world, right? But then the other worlds, he's not in control of. A person could say that, but we don't believe that. Right? We say that God is in charge of the entire universe and everything that's in it as well. Okay? Then we get a little bit deeper. Now, by the way, just to let you know a little bit, uh, my personal connection to it, there is a great rabbi, was a great rabbi called Rabbi Ari Kaplan. He was a physicist, a brilliant individual who just knew Kola Torah Kula, wrote many, many books, died at a very young age. He wrote a very famous book that I mentioned before called Jewish Meditation, A Practical Diet. He knew Kabbalah back to front, and he was a real physicist. He has an essay, which you can see online, on extraterrestrial life. Okay? And he talks about this one essay, and he says, this quote from the Gemara of 18,000 worlds, yeah, may be speaking of spiritual worlds. He does say that. However, he says that it actually is almost definite that it's speaking about life on other planets. Life on other planets. However, he says, I don't believe they have free will. That's his opinion. So they could be very intelligent, just like a computer is very, very intelligent. Just like AI, we're starting to see, has incredible information, but it has no free will. So is it possible that God created 
artificial intelligence on other planets, I don't see why not. God could do whatever he wants, and therefore that's totally up to him. Okay? So that's, we saw Rav Ari Kaplan, okay? we saw Rav Chazdei Kreskas. Then we have a book called The Sefer Ha Bris by Rav Yosef Albo. Now he's already a very, very famous and well-known Rishon who is very respected. He seems to say that, well, it's up for debate. Some say he did not believe in it. I did not see the original. I've seen writings about him. Some say he did believe in it, but he didn't give him much credence because we only have free will. So what are they going to do? Whatever God is doing with them, maybe God needs them for some future time. Maybe they'll need it from some past time. By the way, there are even scientists who do believe in this stuff who will say that maybe they did exist a billion years ago and they died out. It could be. Right? There is a Gemara, by the way, that says that God created 969 worlds, something like that, before this one. Okay? And he built them and destroyed, built and destroyed, and then he created this one and he kept it going. So it could well be that these previous worlds had other beings, and maybe they had technology that allowed them to go to other planets. That could be, uh, that could be possible as well. Okay? So he says it's possible, however, he doubts whether it has their free will or not. Then things get more complicated. Then we move to the Akronim. So now we move into the 15 and 1600s. And there is a famous Akron called Rav Yosef Shlomo del Medigo. And he wrote, he's known as Yasharmi Kandia. And he wrote, and he was a very, very respected individual who traveled throughout Europe and wrote a lot on many, many topics. And he starts at one point discussing how God is great, controls everything on earth, which we all know and have heard many, many times. And then he says, well, is God able to create and control life on other planets? Okay? And he says, I'm going to quote him exactly. This is a, tra a direct translation. He says, now listen to my wisdom, he says, because I've thought about this, and I've thought about this more and more, and I'm intelligent, he says, I know what I'm talking about. I was also humble as well. He says, all my life, I didn't want to believe that our world is the only one here, that there, that there exists, and there are no other worlds, right? That it's just us and the planets that surround us, that influence us. He says, and this is where the Lubavitch Rebbe, I guess, is getting it from, but to say that is limiting God to a designated place. Right? God's hashgacha to one place, this world. And although to us it may seem wondrous and awesome, right? Before Hashem, all of our world is nothing. But by doing so, you're limiting God's hashgacha, His providence to our world, and we're limiting His greatness. Okay. And then he continues and said, I was overjoyed when I heard that there are scholars who believe that the universe is like a lantern. This is the metaphor he uses. And our sun is just here, right? However, we know of other suns that exist elsewhere. And so if we have a sun that has life on this planet, maybe God created other suns which have life on other planets. And he bases this upon Copernicus. We started by talking about Copernicus, who says that the universe our universe, uh, our galaxy is, is heliocentric, that there is, the sun is the center of the, our planets. And therefore he says, I have no problem saying that there's another sun which has planets going around it, and God put life on those other planets. Why? We have no idea. Okay? But it could well be. Then there's another Gemara. And we'll finish with this, and we'll pick this up another time, if you so wish. There's a Gemara in a tractor called Uxin. Uxin. And the Gemara says that God in the future is going to give each and every person who loves him 310 worlds. It's a weird Gemara. God is going to give whoever loves him in the future are going to get 
310 worlds. Now, when you talk about worlds, it can't just mean planets because there's nothing there. So what's the point of it? So the commentators jump on this piece of Gemara, which is based upon a statement from the words of Shlomo HaMalach, Mishle. And over there, it says that in the future, at some point, every single person who is righteous, believes in Hashem, is going to control these 310 worlds. That's what the Gemara says. Three hundred and ten worlds, right? And it quotes Mishle, the words of King Solomon. Says this Yasha Mekandia, this guy, this Acharon. He believed that these worlds might mean physical worlds, and they are all part of our vast universe, since we see the Talmud believes there exists other planets capable of hosting human life. Right, the Gemara, he's saying this is the source that says the Gemara is saying these are worlds, and it's all worlds, talking people on it. Right, others will refer to it as a, a world. It stands to reason, he says, there exist planets, and there's people on those planets, or creatures of some sort, and they have some life forms on them. That's what he says. You have your hand up? No. Okay. So he definitely uh, believes in it. Comes along, now we go to the 1600s, 1700s. Rav Tuvia Cohen, who was Master Tuvia, he was a, a rabbi born in Metz. He was in Krakow, he lived in Frankfurt, Padua. He traveled around Europe as well. In those days, they did or had to. And he starts by saying, I'm going to give you five reasons why there should be life on other planets. There should be. And these are the five reasons he gives. He then kind of goes back on all five for a minute. But these are the five reasons, and we'll finish with this. He says, number one, if on our small world there exists life, then on larger planets there must surely be life. What we call a kalavachomer. He said, we got a small tiny planet compared to what's out there, and we have life on it, then a larger planet should definitely have life. I mean, it's a weird kind of kalavachomer because we don't just have a planet, we have the perfect conditions, right? We have the water, right? We have the oxygen, we have the sun in just the right place. Right? You know, this, when you were in school, you let the sun is a little bit further away, but it'll freeze to death, a little bit closer, it'll bake. Okay, but he seems to say that, you know, there are other planets that have just the right conditions, so why not? And there's so many of them, it must be. Number two, if all the other planets are desolate and only our planet has life that exists on it, it would be similar to a large forest that has only one little bird living in it. So it doesn't make sense. Now, if I told you there's a forest, Right? With thousands and thousands of trees. And only one tree has a bird in it and his life on it. You'd be like, that doesn't make sense. So that's number two. Which sounds very similar to number one. Right? So he's using his rationale to put forward this thesis. Look, you can believe what he's saying or not. Or agree. You don't have to believe in everything I've said. This is not a principle of our faith. It's not in Kriya Murna. But it's interesting that they speak about it. Number three. What is the purpose of all these stars and all these planets, if some don't have life on them. Okay? That makes sense. That's number three. What's, what's the point of having them in the first place? I mean, what would you answer to that if you weren't a believer? Well, I would say, the way we were brought up, to, that God made an infinite universe so that we have an idea of what infinity is. Right? We can't fathom the idea, if you just stick yourself on Earth, nothing is infinite on Earth. But the universe is infinite, and so we have an inkling of something that just goes on and on and on and on. Right? We can't fathom Hashem, and He can't fathom the infinity of the universe. That would be the answer to this. But He says, right now, right? God didn't have to do it that way, and in fact, He made all this living on it. Number four, this is weird, but I'm going to read what He says anyway. He says, well, we know that astronomers have telescopes. He's writing in the 1600s, 1700s, so they had, you know, rudimentary telescopes. And they were able to see not life, but objects on other planets. That's a bit weird. I don't know what he's referring to, right? But he says they saw valleys, and they see water, and they see hills and stuff. So that's what he seems to say as well. 
So that would be like, you know, that's conducive to life. I guess they didn't fully get the idea of um, other plants. I will mention, I was talking to Ravi Rubin about it just a second ago. It's a side point, but I must mention it. There was a great rabbi called Rav Yonason Ibershitz, who was a very respected rabbi, right, from a couple hundred years ago, a few hundred years ago. He actually describes the entire story of the Tower of Bavel. You know the story? Remember they were the, so as kids, we thought they were trying to build a tower to reach God. No one says that. It doesn't literally mean they were trying to reach God. The usual understanding is they were trying to take control away from God and show that we are now smart enough to build build big buildings and we control the... And therefore, you have to live within sight of this building. It was a form of communism. It was a dictatorship that Nimrod created this tower, this building. Okay? We're going to finish in two minutes. This building. He says quite extraordinarily, I have this source at home, that the people on earth were scared of another mubble, another flood. Their technology to build spaceships, they go to other planets. It's not really extraterrestrial life per se, but they wanted to find a launching pad. So they built a big tower thinking that if they kept sending, God's going to bring another flood. So they'd be able to escape and go to the moon and other planets to survive. That's what he says. Why would they need a a big building to do that, because he said, we know that the air is thinner, and so we'd have a better chance of launching off this big tower. That's Rabbi Jonathan Ibershit's understanding of the Tower of Bavel. And he's a very respected uh, thing. Okay, fine. Number four. Number five, he says, with the recent discovery that all the stars are sitting in the center with everything orbiting around them, and says, according to Copernicus, the planets orbit the sun, therefore it's possible that just as our sun has plants with life, so too are the sun's have planets as well. He kind of goes back a little bit on that, but in the end, he seems to say that there could well be life on other planets. And as far as I saw, he doesn't seem to limit it to creatures with no free will. He leaves the open and says, maybe they do have free will, maybe they don't. It's okay to understand it uh, any other way. I'll do one more source. I have another 15 of them, but just that. Get through it. One more, one more. One second, one second. Ah, okay, fine. Just one of the later commentators who was known as the Sefer Harbris to speak about it says, I am perfectly convinced that the other worlds were created not in vain, but for the purpose of habitation. Convinced. And that there are creatures living on them, not, however, for the reason they have given, right? Not because God just, like, they just exist there, okay? Everything came for the sake of us. That means if they are there, if they are on those other planets, they aren't just there for themselves, they're there for us, because Hashem created this world as the main world, as the center of the universe, and, everything, and this is the world he gave the Torah on, and therefore this is the, the planet that is the most important. Therefore, you could therefore say that the visitations from other planets are related to what we're doing over here. I will bring it up to date and say that it seems to be whenever you see visitation of other planets, the ones that are true, I mean, there's so many, so many accounts, they seem to come with messages. There was one in Africa, and there was a bunch of kids who said they were visited. It's another famous story. And the message seems to be that we're not treating our Earth well enough. That seems to be the message that comes uh, from them. Okay, we just touched this very uh, interesting but unique topic. Any questions, thoughts, comments? So in summation, do you have to believe in it? No. Are there great rabbis that do say it's possible there's life on other planets? Absolutely. Is it a principle of our faith? Not at all. You can carry on and believe it's all nonsense, all hoax, all people who are trying to control us, you know, X-Files uh, kind of stuff, just the government doing stuff. It could well be. That's the short answer. What? Who believes in life on other planets? Put your hand up. Yeah? 
It's interesting. Uh, me, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm in Suffolk. I'm now moving towards it, but I'm in Suffolk. Okay, thanks, everyone. Chazak, chazak. The nit chazak, chazak, chazak. So sorry I called. That's okay. I have literally, it's, uh, I had 